Hey, before I kick off the podcast, I just want to shout out Nextdoor Clothing. Nextdoor, uh, a clothing brand based out of Bondi in Sydney. They're making really nice jeans and shirts and hats. So go and check out their full range at nextdoorsydney.com. They're also artists, so you can go and check out a range of art. They put on rad parties, and I love what they're doing. So nextdoorsydney.com for the full range. Hey, it's Shan here. This week I speak with one of my favourite surf journalists. Actually, no, he is my favourite surf journalist and actually a journalist I like in general. He's a podcaster, surfer, and he's a seeker. It's Mr. Jed Smith. Those of you that are into surfing, you'll have heard of the Swellians podcast. Jed is the creator and and, uh, co host on that show with Vaughn Blakey, uh, aka Vaughn Deadly. You know, they've been around for 10 years doing that and um, since they really got started and they do live events and they've really, you know, become quite predominant in Australian surf culture, but maybe surf culture around the world. I'm sure there's people overseas that listen to them. They, in my opinion, are covertly shifting surf culture. So Jed talks about that in this episode, how there's this real association with surfers as being sort of like larrikins, you know, sort of like maybe drug taking, alcohol drinking, charging, adrenaline filled sort of animals, you know, and they still are that. Surfers are definitely that in a lot of ways. And especially in Australian culture, there's a huge element of, you know, larrikinism. And Jed is a larrikin in a lot of ways, but he's deeply intelligent. He's very well uh, articulated. Is that a word? He articulates well through through his words and through his article writing, which he does for Stab Magazine as well. And Jed's really pushing themes of, you know, personal and self-development and getting to the core of our issues and addressing those issues you know, he's really open about his battles with PTSD, maybe some brain damage from CTE through his days of rugby league playing and street fighting, which he refers to quite often. He's open about the modalities he implements, such as ice baths, breath work, the use of psychedelics, the use of CBD oil, all on his journey of, of healing and self-realization. And I find him a really beautiful human and I'm personally drawn to him. I personally identify with his story and his upbringing. So, yeah, it's great having him on again. He's already been on once before. You can go and check out our first episode. Man, I don't know numbers. It's in the back catalogue somewhere. I think it's definitely after episode 50 somewhere. You'll find it. But uh, go and listen to it. In that first episode, we sort of delve more into his background a little bit more. But in this episode, we just sort of, we really delve into the modalities that he's implementing at the moment and uh, things that he's got, you know, on the horizon uh, in his sort of professional career and uh, also personal life. So it's, it's a great episode. I really enjoy it. So yeah, get to know Jed Smith, everybody. Enjoy. Terrible happy talks. Terrible happy talks. There's so many rad skaters up here. There's a f- and I'm just sort of connecting more with that community. Like I still surf every day, but I don't know. Skaters are my people, you know. Mm, so. Yeah, it's a lot more. Uh, yeah, a lot more kinship in the skate world. A lot less hierarchy. The uh, surf realm is just fucking so bogged down in hierarchy and arrogance, and uh, it's quite a funny one. I was thinking about it yesterday. Yeah, it, c- it can be a little bit disheartening over the years, you know, when you see the same patterns. I don't know. Why do, why do you think surfing breeds that hierarchy? Is it because of the conditions? Uh, yeah, it's just competition over resources, isn't it? There's a, a lack of resources, so it has this really virulent form of hierarchy uh, where, you know, people are generally trying to be as unwelcoming as possible because they don't want you to compete for waves. Uh, they'd rather, like... It's like uh, it's almost like classic 
capitalism in a sense where it's like keeps the inferior classes down and makes them feel unworthy and shit so the elites can pilfer all the resources more than their share. <laughs> Good call. Am I, am I going to come a little bit closer to the camera? And can you tilt? Because I am doing the visual aspect, let's get it right. Maybe, okay, tilt it slightly down. I'll tell you when. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. There's that beautiful face. <laughs> um, wow, man. So we're away. Yeah. Are we recording? We're recording. Yeah. Cool. So tell me about the last week of your life. I understand you've been in WA. Yeah, went over to WA, did a couple shows over there doing the True Grit live tour and uh, had a hell time. Yeah, it was really fun. Um, Margaret River, Perth, epic shows. We had uh, a really sick little morning before the show at Marg's. We did a kind of like a, a swellness, mini swellness thing. We all, about 30 of us did Wim Hof and – yoga and got in the ice bath and uh yeah it was so so powerful a eh? charging up with all of those people like that yeah that seems to be a big part of your life at, at this stage can you tell me you know what's been drawing you to the ice bath and the and the deep breathing the wim hof breathing um just the survival aspect of it the uh, what i realized recently was pretty well most mental illness, if not all, apart from the acute like schizophrenic variety, all the like anxiety and depression in the world generally comes down to low energy. Like it's not some super mystical thing. Like if you have a lot of energy, then you're not really going to be mentally ill as far as I could tell, like unless you're, you know, uh, psychopathic or uh, schizophrenic and having like a psychotic break obviously you can be high energy in those kind of erratic states but um you know in terms of depression and anxiety yeah if you just have good energy high energy you, you're not you're not really gonna feel those conditions and you can create energy like there's tools to create energy so um you know at a certain point in your life if you just get sick of sick and tired of feeling sick and tired, you realize that there's these mechanisms in life that just allow you to generate immense amounts of energy and and then mental illness ceases to be an issue. But it starts again every day, so you got to generate that energy on the daily and that's what I do. I just got out of the ice bath, did some yoga. Yesterday, uh, you know, it was the same thing. Every day is pretty much the same. It's Wim Hof, meditation, ice bath, some form of movement, um, you know, building community as well is important. I do that through jiu-jitsu now and, and through surfing and, yeah, so, um, but, yeah, those, like, pretty hardcore healing modalities, in particular the, the Wim Hof oh, and the ice bars, like, they just generate so much fucking energy, man. It's, it's undeniable. Like, you know, Wim Hof is all about, generating adenosine triphosphate atp which is essentially it's the way i understand it it's almost similar to steroids in a sense but it's like a energy steroids like it just charges your mitochondria up so the the mitochondria are the cells inside your body that uh, store energy and control energy and release energy uh, and as you get older your mitochondria deteriorate so you your energy levels often begin to decline but whilst that is somewhat the natural process you know you can create energy like i said there's techniques um that allow you to just fucking pump yourself right up and Mm -hmm. um yeah that's what i do on the daily and then the uh ice baths i mean you get like i think like a 200 to 300 percent increase in dopamine that lasts for six hours so uh, you know, you're pretty well fizzing for, for ages. Um, and, uh, yeah, that enables you to basically go through life. So, yeah, dopamine's an interesting one. Dopamine is the molecule of more. So, like, when I get out of the ice bath, I'm so fucking jacked on dopamine that all I want to do is do chores because chores, completing tasks, gives me more dopamine. So, 
immediately kind of create this positive loop of dopamine just by dipping myself in the ice. And then on top of that, like, um, you know, cold stress, heat stress, and emotional stress all shows up in the body as the same thing. So by training yourself to deal with cold stress or heat stress, you're training the body to deal with emotional stress. And, uh, yeah, so next time you get triggered or lose your temper or whatever, um, your body your body doesn't flood with cortisol, the, the, the carcinogenic stress hormone that cancels serotonin and, and prevents any, you know, feelings of happiness, just leaves you feeling that searing, anxious, jabbing pain for a day or days or weeks or, you know, can go on indefinitely until you snap yourself out of it with uh, some Wim Hof and an ice bath. So good. Are you enjoying some long-term benefits now that you've been doing it for a while? Uh, yeah. 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 You notice your immunity is a lot stronger and you don't get mm. sick anymore. Okay. Um, and that emotional, emotional regulation feels better in general? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, undoubtedly. Uh, I think that, yeah, the long-term benefits really are – that when you trigger or get angry, you don't react the same. Like your body doesn't react the same. So, you you, you know, a lot of anger seems to come from um, something bad will happen and it creates a, a feeling in the body, a feeling of anger, and then you think about that feeling. So you start to fuel the emotion with the thinking and it creates a loop. And, um, you know, thinking fuels emotions and emotions create thoughts and it's just cycling away and you, you deepen into the anger and the, the triggered state and the cortisol floods your system and then you're fucked. So um, I do notice that like where I, I had to be really careful and maybe if I like even had a little fucking little spout of anger, I could be really fucked up for a couple of days. Um, I think that's like the – that's what complex PTSD does to you. It's just um, you're so hypersensitive to those emotional disturbances. Your body's like so geared to go into fight and flight. And when it's in fight and flight, you just pump and fucking cortisol through your central nervous system. And that that was man, that was rough. I reckon around thirty. It's fucking awful. I eh? just the constantly triggering myself and constantly ending up like just run down and sick and like every little cut would get infected and I was always run down, like always low energy. Um, why, why was 30, why was 30 a decisive time you think? Um, I think I've been just headed in that direction for my whole life and then just bottomed out at 30. Yeah. You know? I couldn't, like, had nowhere to run anymore. Yeah, exactly. It just, it has to, break at some point if you're living that lifestyle and you're unaware of it you just eventually get to a point where your body and brain and emotions are all deteriorating and it's all just apexing and you can't get through life and that's when you're on rock bottom and that's when all the uh you know suicidal thoughts start to overwhelm you and intrusive thoughts and stuff like that and then you know at that point it's usually when people reach out and begin to seek help at that point but you know, fuck, man, it's hard to get good help in this culture when most of the solutions come in a little packet in the form of pills or, uh, you know, you, you go into some fucking seven-year-old white-haired GP for advice who, you know, stopped learning the day he walked out of his university. Mm. Yeah. Not an interesting scenario with our system in regards to they have the mental health plan, you know, to make access to a psychologist's you know, more affordable. You know, you can get six sessions, you go to your GP. Yeah. And, uh, was, you know, it was great. I was like, and I found I found an awesome psychologist and I utilized it, you know, got these mm. cheap, cheap psychology sessions. And then I was in a situation where I had to get insurance for something. I was, I had a mortgage at the time. And they asked, oh, have you got a history of mental health and I, or ever been on a mental health plan? I was like, mm. well, just being honest, you can't, yes. And it fucked with my premium and they wouldn't insure me for a certain thing. And I'm like, it's so I was put at a disadvantage. I was never met. I wasn't prescribed medication. I just needed someone to talk to. And I was given some awesome solutions really around breath work and meditation. Mm. Awesome psychologist. I had him on the podcast recently because he's an advocate 
practitioner for a psychedelic assisted therapy. Mate, that's amazing. You lucked out there because, I mean, generally psychologists are pretty good in my experience. They were, they were all, I've seen many and that they were all good. Um, but it's just that at a certain point you realize that, you know, you're the you're the master of your own destiny in, 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 in – like that's the reality of it. You know, you can't fucking talk your way out of this shit. Like they can – they can offer you some uh, tips and advice. Like if they're putting you on the path of breath work and meditation and psychedelic assisted therapy, that's amazing. Like that's what they should be doing. Um, but at the end of the day, you still got to do that shit every day. And, and at, at a certain point you realize that like, that's what matters. It's not talking to people. It's just waking up every day and doing that shit. And that's, and that's what, what he that's said. Where I'm at. Like, I can tell there's no, he said, there's no shortcuts. He's been a psychologist for 18 years. And he said, it's the people that lean into the pain are the ones that get the best outcome. And mm. he said, when someone has a psychedelic experience, it's not enjoyable for most of that time. If they're really going deep. Yeah. And, and never and enjoyable for me. I fucking get my ass kicked by psychedelics most of the it. time. That's what he said. And he's like, so, you know, you've got to do the work. As, and, and that's he said that's the biggest problem is people trying to run away from pain and suffering, whereas you lean into it. That's when you get the long-term benefits. But it takes work. So I think that's why I'm drawn to you because you're pretty vocal about it. Do you get many people reach out to you in regards to it? Yeah, we get lots reaching out through Instagram on, uh, on the podcast channel, the, the, the swelling or whatever. And, uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's – Definitely, I don't know if satisfying is the word or it's, uh, you know, fuel for the fire, I guess, to, to keep doing what I'm doing because obviously like a big part of the podcast is celebrating the degeneracy and, the, you know, alcohol and drug-fueled escapades of surfing culture. And a lot of the time at the live shows and that, like, everyone gets real intoxicated and, uh, you know, we'll have like, I'll have like maybe one or two beers during the, the, the show and, you know, there's all kinds of shenanigans going on. But I do notice that like, um, you know, the personas that we adopt and the culture that we kind of celebrate and laugh about is in essence really toxic and dangerous to people. It, it, it really is. Like even smoking pot I've come to realise is, is, is far from benign. It's, it's very damaging when done more than twice a week, you know, like it, I mean, I got stoned last night and, you know, fuck my sleep. So today I'm feeling tired and low energy and anxious a little bit. And, um, you know, obviously I went through all the the disciplines that I do and I'm feeling a lot better, but, um, you know, I I can see that how it's acting in my system and it's, uh, you know, there's studies out there. I think, uh, the Huberman lab did a great episode on weed where it's like in, if you smoke weed chronically, which is like two or more times a week, you're likely to get depression. Like that's pretty crazy. And, you know, two or more times a week, fuck, it's like it. I know most people I know smoke more than twice a week uh, and it will lead to depression. And, yeah, that, I guess like uh, for us it's important or for me, it's very important to balance out the shenanigans and the, the jokes and the celebration of that drug-fueled uh, alcoholic culture with uh, the reality of it too and, and also the, the methods to not end up in a shit heap after overindulging for years on end. So, yeah, I've got to, to have any kind of uh, conscience, I've got to push both the, you know, the potty and all the laughs and that, but then also push the solution. Personally, I kind of feel like you're covertly shifting the culture. How do you feel about that statement? Uh, yeah, that's how I kind of think of it. Do you? I think of it, yeah, like, you know, I get that you're just not going to, you know, you're not going to bring people into the fold of taking care of themselves in, in that wellness space with, uh, by wearing linen pants and, and speaking spiritual tropes, you know, that all that all that healing shit, it seems to exist in this space that's so alienating to your average blue-collar person. And, um, yeah, it's definitely my mission to you know, get information and, and healing methods in, in front of the people who need it most, which is the poor and the working classes. They suffer, you know, working six days a week, fucking swinging shovels in heavy debt, 
getting taxed to the shit house. Like it's it, it's hard in, in, and there's a lot of stress. And um, so, yeah, I, I want to get those things in front of those people and also get rid of the, the stigma around them, you know, and that's why we do these wellness or swellness events and we get very atypical swellness uh, patrons down there, you know, bra boys like Richie Vakulik and, uh, you know, yeah. two-time world champion turned ice addicts like Tom Carroll turned, you know, uh, reformed ice addict, like meditated his way out of it essentially, unbelievable. Yeah, no. uh, and, uh, you know, ex-soldiers and, you know, we, we get people who uh, have lived the most hardcore lifestyle that you can imagine uh, and they have – seen the light and the truth at the end of living that lifestyle and it really no one gets out of that lifestyle alive or with a family intact or feeling well like it it, it fucking it ends in heartbreak and a shit show 100 percent of the time so this is all just truth i guess it's all true i it's all just I, I run according to truth no dogma no ideology just kind of play what's in front of me and speak truth let other people speak theirs and as far as i can tell it, it pretty well all leads to uh, the kind of practices that we're you know espousing and encouraging i also think for you you know being a long time journalist and podcaster you know interviewing you know countless amounts of people you know you probably see these patterns emerge you know you see you see the same themes occurring in in a lot of these guests, especially within that culture. So it's, I think it's a pretty valid observation really. Yeah, for sure. Like our culture celebrates, um, you know, just adrenaline fueled risk taking behavior. Like as a young man, particularly, you're not really worth anything unless you're, you know, packing big pits or, you know, jumping in a cage or, uh, you know, running the ball real hard or tackling people real hard or or drinking heaps of booze or doing heaps of drugs. It's like this culture of extremes. And then um, on top of that, you've got like the the aspirations for working class people is to have a house, a big house and a car and a plasma screen TV and all of these kind of material things. And none of what I just mentioned there is in any way conducive to feeling good on the daily in fact it's almost all set up to make you feel like shit um or it will eventually make you feel like shit you know i loved football and i you know i love training in martial arts and and fighting and stuff like that i don't love fighting but i love the the training aspect to it all and there is some positives in that space as long as you have the right mentors and in guidance while you're undertaking it all yeah i'm with you there it's funny. I've been more drawn to violence. Like I love, I love, I love um, controlled violence. I think mm. almost compassionate violence. Like I'm heavily into MMA. I don't want to have a fight, you know. But I listened to a podcast you did with Sterling Spencer, and that shook me up, you know, because I started thinking about the amount of head knocks I've had in my life and times where I've probably been concussed, but just not even acknowledged it. Sometimes it's pulling into a closeout. Or a barrel and not coming out. Uh, sometimes it's like a heavy duck dive and then you get ragdolled because you couldn't get deep enough. There's been times on my skateboard where I've been knocked out twice, cold. Mm. You know, and then I look at the patterns of my life and I'm like, man, like, do I have CTE? You know? So I notice you talk about CTE a fair bit, you know. Where, mm. where are you at with that? Do you want to enlighten us a bit more? Um, yeah. Well, so. Yeah, start with that one. I mean, CTE, I forget exactly what it stands for, concussive traumatic encephalitis or something like that. Yeah. Um, And it's basically a condition sustained from too many head injuries. Um, Very common in combat sports. Probably the worst for it is your rugby league, rugby union and – and NFL. And boxing obviously also really bad – um, but the UFC actually has a, a really good protocol in terms of taking care of people when they do get knocked out. They, they, you know, you, you got to spend six weeks, I think, just on the sidelines, not doing anything, and, and that's key. Like it's all about um, how to take care of it in in the immediate stages after a head injury. Mm. Where I'm at with it, 
Yeah, like, you know, well, your average rugby league player, professional, has, I think, 37 concussions and maybe something like oh, somewhere around like 10 were out cold. It's ludicrous numbers. And, yeah. you know, I was fairly elite at football, but not, uh, and it, like, didn't go to that next level playing for money. But even at that level, I still had something like 12 to 15, not all playing football, but the majority. Um, and I think I was out cold maybe three or four times. Um, but a couple of those injuries were just wallopers, man. Like the worst was surfing when I was a kid, just fracturing my skull and uh, had bleeding on the brain, essentially what the injury Owen Wright had. Um, but we got to it a bit quicker. So I didn't have the, the gnarly deterioration that he had. Also, it happened at a different age. I don't know if that factors into it. But then, uh, you know. Yeah, I think that's a big one. Yeah. And then from that point on, uh, you know, I probably could have just hung up the boots then and, and stopped doing any kind of combat sports. But instead, I had a year off and went back into it as hard as ever. And, yeah, I went absolutely mad to the point, like, in my early 20s, I, like, after all the fucking – fighting and street fighting that goes on on the peripheral of playing football of you know it's just like a fucking hoodlum fest isn't it like you're playing football in south sydney like these beefs spill out outside the field into the nightlife and so on and so forth so you just end up you know by my early 20s well it's was fucking man, i didn't care whether i lived or died like i was happy to die in the street fight and i just just didn't, didn't the thought didn't bother, bother me like i looked at 30 is ancient and that I actually didn't think I was going to live past 30. I had like, I, I guess maybe most young people think that, but I, yeah, I, I remember just thinking, oh, I'm going to be fucked by 30. So whatever, like live, live fast and hard now. And as it turned out, I was pretty well fucked by 30. I think it's a common, it's a common age. Like you said before, you summed it up pretty good. I think that's when it catches up with people. You can only run for so long. Like it hit me at 30 and I just was in this state of, and I I really identify with you, Jed. Like I always have, I mean, I'm a fan of the podcast and your work, but I identify because I I see the similarities in our childhood and our behaviors and yeah, Mm. and that, and then hitting that rock bottom around 30 where I just didn't care if I lived or died. But it actually, then I, you know, I sort of battled it for another five years and I got to 35 and that was when the big one and that was – and it's for me it started with like, well, I've got to stop drinking or using mm. any substances because I thought that was the problem. But really what I was doing is just I was trying to numb, mm. you know, what was going on in my head and, and self-medicate, you know, that common yeah. – you know, that, that old adage of self-medication. Yeah, and so when I took the alcohol and the substances away, it's like my actual life felt more raw than ever because all of a sudden I'm I'm feeling healthier. Yeah. I'm, fe- I'm, I'm feeling shit. You're feeling I'm shit, like, yeah. oh, no, fuck, and this is scary. Yeah. You know? And then you start looking for answers and, you know, it's I'm now 46 and I'm and it's only now I'm starting to find this inner peace through – through the mo- you know, utilizing the modalities that you that you do, and just, mm. but it's sometimes it's great, and then there's other days where it's just like, oh, I'm done with this shit. I can't do this anymore. You know, mm. can't do what? More, more, can't do life. Like, oh, I'm just yeah. like you know, and I get, you know, you can easily get weighed down. But with those days, like, I still maintain that if you do six rounds of Wim Hof on those days, you'll be fucking and have a cold shower or an ice bath if you go one. Like you'll be straight back into the fight, you know. Like, you reckon? Yeah. Well, have you have you done it? Like on those days when you're feeling? Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, I've drifted away from it, and I probably need to. You've actually reminded me. Here's your answer, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <man. laughs> like, there's no no easy way to put it. Like it's like it like. Yeah, I can remember at the start of, uh, you know, at the start of the journey, just dipping my toe in. Like, you know, that's what you do at the yeah. start. You're like, you fuck, you, you do like a, a session of of breath work, like intense breath work, and it's like, fuck, that was intense. And, um, you know, like you kind of think in your head, surely I'm, I'm good to go for a, a few days or a, a week or a month now. Yeah. And it doesn't work like that. It's, it's a daily thing. And uh, no one, you know, no one wants to kind of admit that to themselves until you, you just got to keep, you just got to hit rock bottom enough times, and then you're like, "Fuck!" Like it's 
fuck, like, I know what I have to do. Psychedelics actually taught me this, like, uh, you know, what you're saying, how you get, you know, some pretty unpleasant psychedelic experiences uh, as I've had and, and you've had and, you know, the learnings that come out of those painful trips are so profound and then you have to integrate it and the learnings were like breath work, movement, meditation every day. You, you, you don't get a choice. It's just That's just it. And I, I think like everyone should really do that and I think it's actually built into a lot of cultures to do that, um, you know, like okay. the really faith-based ones anyway, like – all through Indonesia and uh, yeah, I guess the Hindu and and Islamic worlds, like there's so much prayer, which is meditation. It's the same thing, and um, you know, a bit of sport here and there, or just even it could be just farm work on your little plot of land. Like that's 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 uh, movement and meditation wrapped up. And I, I don't know yeah. whether they're doing intense breath work. They probably don't have to because they don't really play rugby league. So. <laughs> You know, you know. Obviously, I, I can just sort of feel you're on a spiritual path, but that term spirituality, you know, it's kind of a cringy term for the working class dude, yeah. labourer, who probably needs to hear it the most. I mean, wherever you at with that, do you feel yourself wanting to align with a religious denomination, or are you developing some kind of relationship with a higher power of your own understanding? Yeah, I think in this process spirituality just means thinking about someone else than yourself like that's all it is it's just fucking not being a self-absorbed moping cunt that's bringing everyone down around you you know so like um yeah that's that's the motivation to to do all that shit in the morning that's the whole point you do it is to be better for the people around you that's spirituality that's all it is um, but it's been that, that word's been tarnished by a bunch of fucktards in linen, like who don't do any of this shit. A bunch of fuckwits in Mullum who, you know, bang on about being spiritual or whatever, but they don't do any of the practice, you know. And but re- religions, and you could name, uh, you know, nouveau spirituality as a religion, but religions are always full of fuckwits who, um, don't practice what they preach. That's the problem with religion. I'm gonna I'm gonna say something when you're when you're ready to to respond to that. Yeah, uh, we'll go for it, man. Well, just I had a, a past guest just uh, yesterday. This guy Sid Tapia is an old Australian pro skateboarder from Sydney, but he's now a profound artist, muralist artist. Um, and he's, you know, he's a man of faith, deep faith. And if you look at his life, like the fruits of his, his, you know, faith are undeniable. Beautiful family, uh, producing amazing artwork. He's an ambassador for Ruka, you know, and making money off off his passions, which is one of the hardest things to do, right? And I said that to him. I said, you know, a lot of people. I just see. I've had. I see toxic churches and religions, and I. And, I, and he goes, well, what do you expect, man? It's full of broken people looking for answers. Like, mm. you know, who are you to judge? Like, you're not broken. The only diff. And so that's why they get called hypocrites a lot. And he's like, why are people surprised? It's like it's where broken people go, and they're going to keep being broken, and they're going to keep fucking up. And he's like, have you ever fucked up? Have you ever hurt someone's feelings? You know, have you ever acted inappropriately? Like, it's still the same. They're still flawed humans because I don't understand why people who align with religions are expected to be the ambassadors of perfection. And I was like, fuck yeah, it's true. We judge hard. Yeah, it's such a good point. I mean, for me, it just comes down to what the the daily practices are that you engage with. Like, that's how you connect with God. God, You connect with God um, through these practices and, and where you ask like do i have a connection with god like i guess so like all i know is that when i commit to this disciplined routine that keeps me in a state of flow and and uh, it opens me up to opportunities because my energy levels are higher my frequency is higher it sucks in different kinds of opportunities and uh, a better life. Like since I started doing this shit, my life's done a 180. It's insane where, where I'm at now compared to five years ago. Um, and yeah. I can tell. Yeah, you, you could call that the work of God. But I just like, if you look at all these religions, they're all pretty well the same in what they advocate. So like the problem is people don't do what the religions advocate. And what the religions advocate is like prayer, fasting, community work selflessness like but it's it's the methodology like the daily shit that's where the kind of 
yeah, the Muslims are onto it in that respect. You know, they're so committed to their prayer. And prayer, if you've read that book, Breath by James Nestor, have you read that book? Incredible book. But it makes this insane point that across all religions and even like the ancient, uh, you know, I don't know if you call them religions, but say like the Native Americans and um, they all have prayers or, or chanting that reduces breathing to five and a half seconds for an inhale, five and a half seconds for an exhale, and that's five and a half breaths per minute. It's like this tripped out Fibonacci sequence, and they all figured it out wow. individually of each other. So when you're praying, you're essentially meditating, and that that speed at which you're breathing fully slows the central nervous system down to this like high serotonin state and creates connection and um, calmness and, and like really good neurochemistry. And so, like, yeah, religions are fucking there's so much genius, man, in, in these, in all of them. Um, the problem is the most pious, preachy people are the ones who practice the least because uh, the more that you practice what it advocates, the less preachy and pious you become. And that's the, the paradox of religion, like, as far as I can tell. You know, the fucking, the self, uh, you know, the, the suicide bombers and the, the, the over-the-top, like uh just pious aggressive religious people i can almost guarantee you that they're doing the least spiritual work out of anyone but the ones that are doing the the regular spiritual work in my opinion they're surrendering their self will constantly so you know islam mm. in islam you know they're praying three times a day so they're constantly surrendering their self will and having like essentially an ego death every time yeah exactly you know, and and I think that the human can like that's the human condition is battling that that ego and and that self will and because that's when it leads into things like you know pride and fear and anger and hatred and then that manifest manifests in their behaviors and actions and on you know on the worst scale it's like it becomes dictatorship you know and and you know death and murder and and, and genocide you know so yeah I know it's good analysis bro. Yeah, no, that's what it is. That that giving yourself up to a higher power, like the surrendering, uh, the letting go, and uh, letting go and just trusting. But th- th- that's key. I-, I took acid the other night at the Blues Fest, and that was the big realization: was just mm. let go and trust. That was the the big epiphany, epiphany. But it's one thing to realize that to integrate it, you can't integrate it through thought you can only integrate it through practice through dissolving the ego on a daily basis and that that's where the practice comes into it and you know i don't advocate ideologies or dogma i just advocate advocate practices because you'll reach the conclusion on your own that's the beauty of it that's the fucking genius of all this shit is that you don't have to tell anyone to think fucking anything you tell them just to do this shit and they'll 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 arrive at the destination perfectly everyone gets to the same place and it'll change and evolve on the way. You know, it's going to change and evolve for you. Like you found something that's working at the moment, but that may change. You don't know. And it's funny, my psychologist friend mentioned like, you know, with these psychedelic experiences and the integration of them into your, you know, daily life, he said he feels that a lot of people are losing the experience that they had in their psychedelic experience and it, it should be like a small part of, of a big plan, like a small part of the jigsaw puzzle. There should mm. be preparation and then post he said the post uh, practice is more important, as important as the experience, because it's great to have these realizations and these downloads during the experience, but you know they, then they can be forgotten and lost and not put into practice, and the, and then it's lost. So, hundred percent, yeah, the yeah. integration is everything. I I was listening to a podcast uh, with Rick Doblin on Joe Rogan just last night, and that's what he's saying. Like, it really, the critical component to psychedelic assisted therapy is the therapy like it's the most important part it's also the most time consuming and expensive and the most problematic when we talk about going down this path of you know legalized psychedelic assisted therapy which i believe begins in july in australia first country in the world to do it well i know some stuff about it now yeah yeah, so it's it's just it is that the integration and the, the therapeutic uh, process that makes it so valuable. Otherwise, it's it is worthless, man. You just keep getting the same fucking message. You know, it's like Timothy Leary said, or one of them said it anyway. When you get the message 
hang up the phone. Um, but people don't do that. They just keep getting the same message over and over again and, and thinking, you know, you get a brief respite. It's like a full, um, it's like Wayne Lynch says, LSD is like detergent for the brain. It scrubs your pathways and you get a fresh crack at it the next day. Uh, like the afterglow of a psychedelic experience is probably the best bit. Um, yeah. But you'll end up back in the same neural pathways, a.k.a. rut, very quickly if you don't integrate what you learned from the psychedelic experience. Yeah, it's kind of sad after talking to my friend. He was like, you know, the actual it's psychedelic-assisted therapy it, through the legal avenues is going to be inaccessible for most people. It's, it, it's you know, our government's just going to over – it's over-regulated. Um, it's going to be – really expensive he said it's for the average person it's going to be like ten to twenty thousand dollars to do that to do it down that way you know and he said it's going to take a very long time before it's accessible to the people that really need it Mm. you know it's going to be for the for the upper class and the top end of society who can afford it people who've also had a long-term relationship with just particular psychiatrists so it's going to be interesting to watch it unfold, but I mean, it is a step in a direction, you know. Oh yeah, it's a, a major so. positive step. Like, there's no two ways about it. And yeah, you're right. It, it, it's shaping up as being very costly. I think, yeah, Rick Doblin was saying in that podcast, was he? the therapeutic process is around about ten to fifteen grand US. Oh, was it? I can't. I haven't listened to it at this point. But uh, who knows? Like, you know, there'll be permutations that come out of this the you know there'll be probably a, a massive boom in underground therapists there'll probably be a lot of therapists who waive that fee because they believe so adamantly in what they're doing and, and the mission they're on or they'll do it for a lot less um so you know there's a lot of altruistic actors in the world particularly in that space um and i mean what's tripping me out at the moment is just seeing this next generation come up and how popular these non-drug uh, therapies are like just we well you asking me you know about getting rid of the stigma of breath work and meditation it's kind of already happened as far as i can tell like it's it, it's right there like fucking i you know i got family that play professional rugby league like the whole team does wim hof together um i met wim hof the other day in sydney and you know there was professional rugby league players there and these guys are the most warrior spec cunts on the planet they're fucking huge they're just like the biggest maniacs but they're there um doing the wim hof and it was interesting actually when i met wim hof and and did the ice baths and that with him like fuck man he doesn't miss a beat this guy like he had put thousands of people through these ice baths and he's there you know carrying on cracking jokes and that but the people he had around the ice baths were all the hoodlums you know the hoodlums the nautica wearing gold chain wearing you know house kids islander kids like they were there helping people in and out of the ice baths like facilitating these things so he fully gets it he's like you know get these methods to the people who need them most and, and then that's where it starts that's really where the journey starts for society if you want to actually change shit you start at the bottom and go up not the fucking other way around i reckon but uh, yeah uh, that said you know you change the the hearts and minds of the ultra rich and the elites and yeah they're gonna let go a lot of resources to the bottom which will allow them the time to spend on healing themselves and whatnot so it works kind of both ways i think we're approaching a a point in history where it's coming from both directions and it's going to meet in the middle in some kind of fucked up utopia mad (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> hope so. I hope so. Have you been actually diagnosed with PTSD? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, complex PTSD, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's like the consequence of, you know, single mother who was beaten up and then become violent herself and then, you know, the fucking flowing effects of that for me are just – thinking that violence is a uh, a means to solve conflicts. <laughs> and you like, know what, sometimes, it, and you know what the scary thing about it is sometimes it does and it works and then once someone has a taste of it working, like maybe in the initial phase they may get a result and that's what's so scary because that causes trauma to them and it, it, in the long term it just causes 
pain, more pain and a cycle of like, I'm going to do that again because I've got to resolve that time. Like that, that guy was being a dickhead. I shut him up. He fucking didn't back chat after that, did he? You know, and then, and then it's like, oh, I've got to, I've got to result there. And then it just continues, you know? Yeah. I mean, I guess now looking at jujitsu, like being part of a gym and just seeing the different characters in there who are so advanced in this ultimate fighting skill. And yeah. it's like, you know, a lot of the people are so atypical of, of like a tough guy. They're, in fact, you know, just the, the kind of, they could be accountants or fucking, they're pretty nerdy looking cats, a lot of them. And I, I love that about it. And, and lightweight women, you know, women who are like fucking 17 years old and 50 kilos and a blue belt. So they'll yeah. fuck me up. And uh, like, uh, like, I guess those people, like, they're not going to go, they're not the types of people to go out of their way to hurt people, but they can neutralize situations very effectively. And um, I think it's taught within that controlled setting how to neutralize situations and be really responsible with the skills that you have. And you have this place to, to get that out of your system in the gym and you don't really feel like flexing on people after that. Um, but, yeah, you have the power to do so. Uh, yeah, and I don't know. It's Please. changed the whole paradigm of, of of like street violence and violence now because you don't know who's a fucking blue belt in jujitsu. It could be anyone. You don't know. I don't fuck with anyone in the street. Oh man, Dude. you just got no clue. But I think you know, doing that type of training, it breeds self confidence in a positive way. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so I've you had, don't have to take shit. Yeah, and I've had a lot of fighters on here. UFC fighters and I, I was training at the same gym as Alexander Volkanovsky and I had Jamie Malarkey on here who fought in UFC 284. He's a, a bit of a veteran of MMA. And again, you, you, you were so, hang out with this guy he, and he's the most peaceful, calm gentleman you'll ever meet. You know, and, and I said, why? He goes, well, there's two things. One, I'm always too fucked from training so hard mm. <laughs> and I'm so tired. I don't want any trouble. Yeah. And then, but then, too, he goes, I, and I had another friend, Jarrett Wilbraham, who's a professional fighter, uh, and he's just like, I do. I just walk around with a level of self-confidence where it's like I don't, I don't have anything to prove anymore. You exactly. Know? Like, That's the key, not having anything to prove. Yeah. So if someone's mouthing off or whatever, you, know, you can be very calm not, uh, knowing that you have the, the power to shut them off, but, like, you don't even have, it doesn't even have to go that far generally. Like, you, you know, that, but people can sense it, too. Like, uh, you know, cool. when someone's triggering and, and losing their shit and trying to stand over someone, if they're not backing down and not shitting themselves and completely calm, like that's rattling, like for that person who's um, wanting to, to, to staunch them. So, yeah, it, it's a beautiful thing. I think so, man. I think so. So let's talk about where you are in life now from my perspective, you know, and I see that you're doing a lot of work with the podcast. I see that you're still writing for Stab Magazine. And tell me about the Swellness Summit that's going to India because I actually wanted to go to it. I was uh, really hoping to make it, but my lifestyle is just not allowing it at the moment with my responsibilities. So what's going on with that? Uh, yeah, so we did that Swellness event first in, in Crescent Head. And yeah. um, that was amazing. Like that was so, so insane. Um, you know, like I, I kind of touched on it before, just getting – it was a couple hundred people there I think uh, or a hundred people or something and, uh, yeah, just had all these absolute just bastions of resilience and fucking hard out living there to tell us what they'd learned in their pretty <laughs> up and down journeys and we all engaged in these – healing methods together and the energy boost was fucking like plutonium grade, like just so off tap, you know, we were just like so buzzed up and we were just, we levitated out of there. It was nuts. Like it just such proof of concept. So it's like any excuse to get a crew together and uh, go around um, you know, generating the energy on the daily and then connecting and, and, and seeing what opportunities you suck in as a group with that heightened energy and heightened frequency. So that's Amazing, what dude. India is. It's like each day we'll be uh, doing, the, you know, breath work, 
meditation and, and yoga. We'll be hiking around the Himalayas. We'll be, um, you know, doing community work while we're there and just seeing what where it all leads with a collective consciousness that's a fucking fireball of goodwill. And raising your vibration. Exactly, raising it as a group. It's easy when you do it as a group and okay. the benefits are also amplified somehow. Like I was chatting to uh, James, our Wim Hof instructor, and I was asking him about that because I do Wim Hof every day, but when you do it with 50 other people, it feels very different. Like it, it's, it's, a, it's a lot, it's just more intense. It's more euphoric. And I was like, what is that? Like, yeah. And he was saying there's nothing in the science about that. That, that, that can't be proven. It's just a, there's a magic to it when you yeah. do that. And I don't know what it is. That's when you become, enter that kind of um, connection with God, religious kind of mentality because it's like, wow, what is that thing that's coursing through us that enables us to, as a group, amplify. Like it's like a, giving us a sign. It's like a sign from the heavens that, yeah, if you connect and do this together, you can multiply the energy, multiply the goodness in the world. And, man, it's psycho. So, yeah, we'll be doing that in India. I think this may still be open. Uh, I think there's 10 of us on the pilgrimage. And, uh, yeah, if you're interested, I'd – I don't know when this is going to air, but jump in very quick because it's about to shut. But uh, up, up the swellings at gmail.com if you want to uh, jump on board. And, uh, yeah, there will probably be a surf trip somewhere or there will definitely be surf trips tacked onto the end of it. If that floats your boat, there will be people going to Sumatra, Sri Lanka and elsewhere. Um, so, yeah, just a, a really powerful and, and positive experience in a part of the world that's very holy, you know. We get, we, it all starts in Dharamshala where the Dalai Lama and – uh, all the Tibetan exiles live, and then, uh, yeah, the, we'll just be meandering around the Himalayas. Are you going to tack on a surf trip yourself? Yeah, I will. Yeah, not, I'll probably just wait till I'm there. We have board storage in Delhi, so just drop the boards off at the airport and then uh, pick them up on the way back through and um, head off somewhere. I'll kind of have to wait and see where that place is. India India is an obvious one, but uh, when I was in Bali last, I connected with a guy who has an awesome – you know, uh, accommodation in A Bay in Sri Lanka, you mm. know, and obviously much more mellow waves, but it sounds like the experience would be crazy there. Elephants, on, you know, wild elephants still roam around on the beach and stuff while you're surfing. And it sounds pretty cool, but yeah. Yeah. Hey, on another note, like, where are you at with your podcasting journey? You know, it seems like you're banging out a lot of episodes. Are you, are you still really inspired with it? Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, what keeps me going, like, you know, uh, I was chatting a couple of lads last night. There's guys on building sites who depend on it to get through their day. So that's why I do it. Yeah. That's why um, I do it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when I was growing up swinging shovels, it was all about the 2KY big sports breakfast every morning, three hours of fucking sports chat. And, um, you know, we're not quite providing that level of content, but we're trying to, yeah. You know, give people some laughs and some fucking guidance where possible. And, uh, yeah, just give people some entertainment while they go through the, the rigmarole of their daily life, daily jobs. So good, dude. So good. It's funny. I, I went through a phase of it where I'm just like, oh, why do I do this? It's so much work. And then, I, you know, you fall into this pattern of like, oh, it's not sustaining me an income or a lifestyle. Like, oh, it's, and it's a grind. You know, and then I was sort of feeling like I was just going to give up on it. But then I got some guy from England message me. He goes, hey, I'm a, I'm a window cleaner on Sky Rises and I'm up, you know, I'm up like 30 stories hanging on an abseil and I've got your podcast in my ears while I'm wiping windows, yeah, you know. And I just was like, dude, he goes, he's like, thank you so much. Like, it gets me through the day. I'm like, no way, you know. And then I've had like house painters are a common one as well. Yeah. And, that, and that's why I don't really fuck with the visual aspect too much because I'm like, it's, I mean, I still work full time as well. So I'm like, yeah. I and I noticed, you know, you've sort of pulled away from that. Uh, so, yeah, good, good for you, man. I can tell you, you're doing it for that reason. Well, yeah. I mean, and, We've been doing this for 10 years. Like or I, when I started it, you know, I was on, on my own or with another boat, Ryan, that was 10 years ago. And uh, 
very early adopters of this medium. Like, I, I don't even, I, I didn't know of any podcasts in Australia at that point, and I didn't find out about Joe Rogan for another five years after I started a podcast. Like, the only one I knew of that existed was Mark Maron's podcast. Mark Maron's podcast was amazing, by the way. Mm. Worth checking out. I don't know if he's still doing it, but he's a ex Saturday Night Live comedian. Um, very similar to Rogan, and he had the biggest dogs on his podcast, including the sitting president, Barack Obama, who came to his garage and was on his podcast. And, um, it's a trip. Yeah. You know, you know one of the first surf podcasts I listened to was this one called Lipped with Neil, like Neil Ridgway was doing it. Remember Neil Ridgway? Yeah. And I was like, that's pretty rad, you know. And then it was shortly after I sort of came across the Swellians. Mm. You were, I think you were already around, but Yeah. 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 Why, why journalism for you, Jed, originally? Um, yeah, it was kind of fell into it by chance. Like at the start, you know, I want to be a pro footballer and then my mum was like, oh, I was real good at football when I was younger and my mum was like, yeah, but like you need a plan B. So I was like, oh, I'll be a, I'll be a rugby league commentator. And then um, as I got older – kind of lost interest in football a little bit, like still played in all the best teams and, and rep teams and whatnot. But um, in my teens, you know, football wasn't that cool. It was all about surfing. So I started to pivot a bit and I was like, fuck, I've got no chance of being a pro surfer. But uh, what about being a surf journalist? And so, yeah, just kind of the plan B shifted from being a football journalist to being a sports journalist. But then, yeah, like, um, you know, also, fuck, man, like laboring with my uncle in Forbes, who was a fucking slave driver when I was a kid. Like, man, he, he was up against it trying to make money um, coming from the bush. It was, fuck, it was hard. It was just, we were a poor family in those days, and he's made money now. But in those days, he was cracking the whip, man. And I was just like, fuck this. This is brutal. I do not want to do this. I want to fucking sit down for a living. <laughs> so, yeah, that really, uh, that really motivated me to get off the job site. Um, and yeah, ended up in, uh, getting a job at a surf mag, stab mag back in the day. And, uh, a few years of that though, and I had a gut full. It was just so fucking boring, man. Writing about sport or like even just surfing every day, it just was so boring. And I was like, you know, I grew up in a, a, a very poor, but very educated and politicized household. So like, uh, I was very exposed to, just the the fucking ridiculous horseshit of capitalism uh, from a young age, you know, just constantly have to move house because landlords were putting the rent up on us and just the lack of compassion and um, also just the, the greed, how uh, sickening it all was. And so as I got older, um, you know, I wanted to have a crack in the, the, the mainstream journalism space. I didn't have any connections in that world really, so that was quite difficult. Um because uh, that's the way the media works. That's why it's so crooked is that you've got to have uh, – it's who you know, you know. So you don't did know. Did you that. transition to News Limited? From, was it, did you yeah, work for News Limited? one guy I did know was Fred Paul from, uh, who worked for Stab and The Australian. And he helped us get one article up, I think, for The Oz, which was about Dingo Morrison, and then uh, maybe there was one other surf one. And then once you got those two little runs on the board – you can then use that as a bargaining chip to to pitch to other people and be like, look, I wrote for these two people. So it was always my intention to get out of that sports space and just maneuver through the fucking matrix to a point where I could write real stories. Um, and, you know, they're never opinion. It was always the same thing. I would get a thesis or a hypothesis from various characters on the ground, just people living their everyday life, suffering under some system failure. I'd talk to them about the system failure and then I'd ring up a university professor and be like, "Is are these complaints legitimate? Like what's your take on this shit? So you would go from the punters getting fucked and then you would ask the the professor for their take on it and that way you've, you know, you get like the full scope of an issue, I guess, and I applied that methodology to – well, uh, you know, just some of the fundamental levers of capitalism, basically um, housing, commute times, gentrification, um, you know, racism, uh, you know, or, or race, not necessarily racism, but just race, um, 
Yeah, and it was a really interesting period, man. That that was um, super frustrating, that period, because I worked for fucking peanuts for years, probably running at a loss a lot of the time. And But I saw how it all worked, man. I saw exactly how that, that media realm worked in terms of um, the kinds of stories and the kinds of truths that they – deliberately squash and, and marginalize uh and that just motivated me to go harder at it you know like not not accept that and then podcasts come on on the scene just as i was kind of kind of in parallel with when i was working for the newspapers and experiencing the, the corruption of the mainstream media and yeah podcasts are just mate there's no gatekeepers here we can say what the fuck we want it's amazing yeah, and did you like the fact that it was a you know a longer form sort of platform to really convey and express the truth? Yeah, absolutely. That that's the there's no filter. There's the context is always given because you know you're listening to the person talk over a long period of time. You can't sensationalize or decontextualize what they're saying. Um, and yeah, like they they may. People's memories are shit, so people will speak half truths and and misremember and misrepresent facts and stuff like that. Um, so you know it's always wise to do your own research after hearing stuff. But I think most people get that. Yeah. Um, and mate, also it's just far less labor intensive. Like what you got to realize with podcasts, it's this is a this is a cakewalk compared to what print media is and, and writing an article. Mate, it's fucking. Pff, this is a joke. Like we just In talk. What way? In terms of like having to get your references and, and have you ever written an article, man? No, not really. Not a published one, no. <laughs> Bro, like for example, right? Give so, us an example for the average punter. If I was to write an article about you or anyone else, it would involve an interview like this for about this amount of time, and uh, I would basically have to go through the complete chronology of their life story, get it all down. Then I would have to type that interview out, transcribe the whole thing. So it takes, I think as a rule, it takes three to four times longer to transcribe something. Um, uh, so so for an hour interview, you're looking at, you, like it's a full day's work to tran- just to fucking transcribe it, man. To get the interview done and to transcribe it, that's one day gone. One and then. This is one article. And so for one article, you have to talk to, remember, like three to four people generally uh, at a minimum three. So that's three interviews you've got to do. You've got to transcribe all those interviews. And then you've got to do your own research on top, top of that. You've got to fact check everything they've said because if they've said something that's false and you print it, it's not on them. It's on you. Um, so – uh, and then also just writing, like there's a style that's accepted. There's a quality and a clarity of voice that is accepted or it's demanded by that level of writing the, to be a published journalist. And it's an excruciating level to reach. There's no fucking obvious metric for how to do it. There's no exact guide. It's arbitrary. The only way to know is by reading it through in your head and somehow being able to recognize where words are in the incorrect place, the voice they call it, having a good writing voice. And this is something that can only be learned over that 10,000 hours. Like mm. it, it, it's fucking grueling. Um, and, and, and then how do you gauge the success of that article? Exactly. Well, it's gauged these days on clicks. So you can write the fucking most exhaustive, um, well-written, well-voiced article but if it doesn't get clicks you're out of a job they're not gonna they're not gonna pay for it to to get done um so they tend to just go for the lowest common denominator which is bloody uh yeah just freaking sensationalist drama fueled like um, high emotion They, they really try and go towards articles and news that will generate an emotional response Gotcha. Uh, which is, I don't think it's helpful or, or an accurate portrayal of the way we live. Like, you know, this, yeah, they, they really, news is like all the, news is generally the extremes of life, like is depicted in the news, not the banality of 
being an everyday working class person, those things don't ever fucking rate a mention. It's always just like extreme examples of, of living. Do you have a level of compassion then for, you know, article writers and journalists who write for mainstream publications? Fuck no. Not at all. <laughs> It's a crooked <laughs> reptilian industry, man. I hate it. I, I, the reason I don't is because, like, they're generally what those people are. If you want to be a good journalist, you have to be willing to lose your job over the truth and, and, and the articles that you're writing. Like, you just that, – that's, that's the name of the game. That's what the job is. It's just telling the fucking truth. And uh, if people are going to censor – that truth to protect their commercial imperative, then as journalists, you should strike and boycott and uh, wage union action against your employer. But no one ever does that because journalists generally they're like the statistics say that journalists are almost always at the very minimum middle class or upper middle class. And it goes up from there. And um, really they're more concerned with preserving uh, their office job and their wage than anything else so that you know and i have some sympathy in that respect because it's like yeah these people have families they've got mortgages they've got these financial pressures so they can't jeopardize their career by telling the truth because they've got all these responsibilities but you're in the wrong fucking job man and the, the other thing is like they're too scared to be a part of the working class they're scared to lose that job and have to get a job on a job site or in a factory. And that's where I've just got no respect for them. I just think they're pathetic. Yes. Like they are, their main concern is avoiding being a part of the working class. That's yeah. priority number one. And uh, everything else comes underneath that. And if that is your priority number one, you are already uh, completely compromised. Yeah. You nailed it in terms when you said that they're in the, well, you're in the wrong job. If you can't do it and tell the truth because of your lifestyle, you're in the wrong job. So I guess that's where I, I find a lack of compassion for them too. Yeah. yeah, man. Like the the most common cause of death for journalists is assassination. And like if you're going to do journalism correctly, one of three things will happen to you. You'll either be knocked off for doing it, you'll be marginalized, uh, and you'll be poor. Like, or well, yeah, those three things basically. And so I eventually got marginalized and was poor. And but there was articles I was writing too about property where I was like, "Fuck, you know what? Like, I think I'm talking about crooked politicians here, but I know that I know that the mafia runs concreting in 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 the city. You know, like so it's not too hard. Like I remember taking my name off stories for News Limited because I was like, fuck, you know, like I know what happened to uh, Juanita Nielsen in the cross for writing stories just like this in the 70s. She was knocked off by organized crime and happens all the time. Like journalists getting killed is or, or, or roughed up or intimidated is, is so common. Um, so, yeah, but most journalists don't do it the proper way. They just do it the soft way and, uh, you know, live a fairly comfortable albeit uh you know depressing life that's their so kind. so your article writing for stab magazine comes from just pure joy and passion no that's uh that's it's my job i do it for money okay yeah like um there's not a whole there's nothing at stake in surfing you know what i mean what's at stake it's not it's just a bunch of dudes flapping around in the ocean like like it's just not it's what i why i got bored of it like there's not a whole lot of meaning or I, I in it. Like it's fun. It's frivolous. I was going to say but, it's fun. But like that's why the podcast exists because we can have fun with it. But it's pretty hard to have fun with articles, writing. I'm not good at that anyway. I haven't learned how to write funny shit. So, But you seem to always write, even in the surf space, articles that are thought-provoking and provocative and different to the average surf article in my opinion. Have you heard that before? Uh, I guess so, like, but, I mean, at the end of the day, I don't write that much about surfing, you know. I, I, don't, I think the space between my last two articles was months. So, you know, yeah, I, I pick the eyes out of one meaningful issue every now and then, 
and write an article on that. But that's as far as I can tell. There isn't that many meaningful stories in surfing. Yeah. Like profiles, writing profiles about people uh, are super meaningful because – Characters. Yeah, everyone has a story. Uh, everyone has their cross to bear in life. Everyone has uh, had the triumph over adversity and, and profiles are – are great to read they're just fucking torture to write and i don't see the point in writing them when i can just call someone up and talk to them and they can tell their own story why do you need me to tell it so uh, yeah podcasts are a, a much better way to to do a profile of someone because yeah, they can just tell their own story what are some what are some episodes of late that stuck with you or had an impact on you i know you I look I, i'll preface that by saying i'm sure you enjoy every guest you have on but what are some standouts for you in the last sort of six months? Because you've done some pretty profound ones, bro. Mate, let me just get a drink of water first and I'll answer Yeah, no that. rush. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, it's all good. I cooked it. I should have got the water at the start. I filled it up and then I just went an hour without drinking water. I'm dying. <laughs> yeah, I get I, I, I intermittent fast every day. Mm. So I wake up. I'll drink two liters of water with Himalayan rock, pink rock salt in it. That's it. And then, then drink black coffee. I just because I just love coffee, but but I find it just really kickstarts my like mm. digestive system and cleans out my guts. And Coffee's great, fuck, yeah, no. so good. Man, I generally do the same thing. I, I am I do do the same thing exactly. Bit lazy with the water though. That's mm. uh, critical with the salt and the water. You got to put something in it. Yeah, you do. Hey, crucial. And um, I also like. I have the coffee, the black coffee sometimes, but I love having my like coconut cream coffee, my paleo coffee with a bit of MCT oil in it, but I don't know if that takes me out of fasting. Yeah, I think it does because I have this coffee uh, where it's got MCT oil, turmeric, gin, and ginseng in it, and, and oh, I love no it. Like, yeah, I mean, I don't want to say the brand on here. But, oh, man, and I think it does take you out of fasting, but, God, it makes me feel good. And then I, I don't eat till midday off that. So it's like my bunny, my body's running off those good fats as its primary energy source. Cool. Yeah. Nice. And, um, yeah, so it's good. It's good, bro. Yeah. Listen, now, look, I, I won't keep you. I've got some things to do today as well. It's been epic, like, uh, and, like, I've said this numerous times, like, I've, you know, I feel, gra- I gravitate towards you you know, for your, the work you produce, but also just the, the person you are. You know, some people you identify with more than others. It's just how it is. Oh, I appreciate so that, just, bro. Yeah, for sure. So tell me that I just I want to just recap some of your recent episodes. I asked you that. Yeah. What, what, what are some standouts for you? Uh, Can't think of any? Oh, uh, there's no, uh, there's so many that we've put out. So, um. Surf wise, I think the one that was just after the backdoor shootout ended, where we had uh, we were lucky enough to have uh, Mason Ho and Mike Ho on. Wow! Same yeah. time, uh, the phone just got passed around the room, um, and it was just their nephew or Mike's nephew, Kalar Grace, had just been knocked senseless at massive pipe and filled up with water and was in a coma and Mike had surfed in the backdoor shootout. It was huge. And, um, you know, so they were super rattled, but like at the same time, you know, they'd had this amazing uh, experience of the last few days that, 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 what that event just scores the craziest waves. And, uh, so that was a real highlight. I love that episode. Um, that was Mike's first ever appearance on a podcast and you know, it was just epic. Um, Mate, the, the live show we did in Margaret River, which hasn't been published yet, I think is up there with the best ones we've done just for – True Grit. Uh, true Grit tour, yeah, the yeah. just the shenanigans and the like – the way like just, you know, we're ramping up the, the production values as much as our fucking shambolic like four-man team can. But it, it's just like – it's an amazing thing, eh? Like it really is that – just the goodwill of the surfers, the the crowd, like, you know, our role in, in kind of facilitating just silliness and then mixed in with the interviews, which are, are generally entertaining and, and pretty high quality. There's a fair bit of preparation and research that goes into it all. And, um, yeah, really proud of that. And I uh, just I love, like, 
you know, again, it's just really, I don't enjoy doing them that much. It stresses me out, but I see the joy that it brings to people and, and that's why we do it. Mm. That's so rad. What pro service did you have on it? We had uh, Diego Dora and his dad, Leandro, who's, uh, you know, Jack Robinson's coach and um, I guess a couple other people maybe. Yeah. We had uh, Callum Robson and Jackson Baker, just two like, Bogan core classics, just blue collar battle spec icons. Are uh, you know they're just the biggest legends. Love having those guys around. They're just such larrikins all time. And then Jay Davies, uh, who's you know built like a brick shit house and has packed some of the filthiest slabs of all time. He's an absolute master in the juice. Um, so it was, it was rad to bring him on. And you know we had films playing and music and dancing and cultural exchange in this crazy theater and at one point my favorite part actually was um i got this star wars like stormtrooper bong mask which is uh laying around, laying around here somewhere but anyway it was just one of the props <laughs> on the desk and someone yelled out oh like, like the questions you know question time comes at the end and Someone's like, are you going to fucking rip one out of that or, or what? And, and uh, we're in this high-end theater in Margaret River in the art center. And I p- was like, well, if anyone's got, you know, some Mar- some of Margaret River's finest, yeah, I'll fucking rip one. So, you know, within two seconds, someone had thrown a canister or a pot up onto the desk. And I was like packing this fucking stormtrooper mask and there were <laughs> like beers, like half-finished beers on the table. So that become the bong water and... And I just had it on my head, fucking huffing it and huffing it. It's like this full mask. And, uh, I've seen it. I've seen yeah. it. And the then bong's I, attached to the mouth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like as I'm ripping it, I'm revving the crowd up. The crowd's going mad. I, I kind of like pretended to pass out, like because it was <laughs> fucking pretty intense. And Yago, like he couldn't believe it. I could just hear him howling with laughter next to me. Like the Brazilians just. <laughs> I don't know what they make of us. They they come on the show. I think that's another of my favorite episodes. Actually, was the Italo Ferreira Jadson Andre one when he was the world champ and yeah, all the Brazilian dancers. I and remember shit. that he did a Brazilian dance. I see yeah, we, so and good. just like I love that. I really love what the Brazilians bring to surfing. Like so yeah. much grit and determination and just unapologetic work ethic. And um, yes. I think they've brought like something really special. And I love having them on the show and just kind of bringing him into our culture and, and being like, yeah, like, look, we actually fucking love you guys. You're epic. And they, they get it. They, they see all the laughter and love and happiness in the room and they're all in on it. They don't understand before they're there, but in the moment they're like, and you see them when they leave the, the venue, they're just bug eyed and they give you a hug and they're like, that was amazing. And that, that's, yeah. that's an epic perk to it. Yeah. They do generally have like this really like warm, powerful positive energy and i know they get criticized for hustling in the surf but you know i really believe a lot of that is just born from extreme enthusiasm but a lot of brazilians are deeply religious you know that's Mm. that's something i'm noticing i'm just like and that's interesting to me just a an analysis there they're all very religious they all pray they're Mm. all you see them praying before heats all the time and yeah i don't know there's a commonality there man with that energy you talk about yeah, totally. Exactly, man. Yeah, it is such a, a faith-based society, very Catholic yes. and, and, and Christian. And, man, like when approached in the right way with the you know correct amount of practice in, and uh, community and, and selflessness, fuck, faith is powerful, man. And uh, yeah. you, you cool. see it in those guys so much, as you mentioned. Yeah, they, they really do. They, they pray a lot. They connect a lot as a community. They, yeah. they let grudges fall by the wayside very quick, but they go fucking so hard at each other. And Yago was saying actually in the podcast, like after each event, they all meet up for a barbecue and bury the hatchet. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they, they take these tremendous steps to keeping close to each other. And they come from mm-hmm. such a fucking – hard scrabble country where violence and gun violence and crime and poverty is ever present that I think that they really understand the value of life and happiness. They have great gratitude and appreciation for just 
the the little things for calm for for peace like because these things are not a guarantee in their their country yeah good call i I think that's why i've always been drawn to the balinese like so many people Mm. because uh, especially around yepi you know the people don't understand their new year that well i don't think you know they have a day of silence it's a day of silence and reflection and they turn the internet off for the whole country and you're not allowed to have lights on and you know, the, I think the Balinese go even more extreme, and I don't think they really eat. Uh, they don't eat during the sunlight think, hours. Yeah, I but think the, Yepi is only a Hindu thing. I don't think it's across all of India. It's, no, it's it's a Hindu thing. But then the next day after Yepi, I don't know if you know this, but they have to then go around and make amends with everyone they know and say and say sorry if there's anything I've done to harm you or upset you. I'm, I'm yeah. sorry. You go there with a with a uh, a humble heart. Unbelievable. And, and great. And I like, but and that's what I mean. Like, we don't have those kind of cultural practices. Here. We have none of it. We like have, our New Year's is like, let's get fucking wasted. Maybe and that's every cultural pill. practice in this country. Yeah. It's just get like, wasted. fucking wasted. Yeah, get wasted. Because like, oh, I'm cleaner. wasted, uh, I'm unaccountable. Like I was wasted. That's my excuse for being a fuckwit. It's not an excuse. <laughs> but you know what I hate when someone's wasted. Maybe taking a pinger, and then they start telling you that they love you and stuff, but. Oh, you love me, man. You're my best friend, and fucking this and that. And it's like, why did it take six beers and a, and half a ping for you to say that? You know what I mean? And it's just fake. Yeah, you know, I just can't analysis. stand. I can't stand heavily intoxicated people in any in any form. Eh? It just grinds my gears so bad. <laughs> it's true, man. Yeah. Listen, Jed, it's been epic, man. I love your work and love um, you too, bro. Is there anything you want to end on? Anything you want to you, you want to um, promote or tell us or no, mate? I don't know. Keep- uh, if you want the biggest charge up, if you want to charge your crystals like they've never been charged before. Keep an eye out for the Swellness event, which will be coming up later on in the year. Um, you know, the, the, it's the ultimate cure for mental ailments, and the whole point. You know, if you don't have money, that's sweet. We'll give you a free ticket. The whole point is to get this in front of the people who need it most that's that's why we're doing what we're doing so like um, a reset the biggest reset mate it's it's next level so i'm devastated i can't go yeah no no that's we're talking about two different things so that's the trip to india oh excuse me yeah and then there's the swellness event which is like a three-day festival that we did at crescent head so that's going to happen again yeah it is like a, a a bonus yeah it's just a trip yeah. Born out of But what that. else is what else is what's up next for you aside from those things? What else is in the works? Uh sorry, I cut it out for a second there. Yep, just keep rolling because it's still taking the audio and the visual from your end. I think you've got shit internet. Okay. What was the question? What's 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 next for you? What's in the works uh with whatever you're doing? Uh... aside from those events. Yeah, just uh, just continuing with the tour, really. Yeah, okay. I think we've got a show in Sydney. Uh, we've got one on the Gold Coast. We've got one. Uh, we've got a fundraiser for Blake Johnston, the techno Viking who <sighs> broke the the world record for the longest surf and raised a fucking trillion bucks for epic causes. So uh, we'll be down there in Cronulla on the twenty eighth. Um, yeah. Did that spin you out? I kind of thought when I heard he was going to do it, I thought he's just going to go and sit out in the water for hours. I don't, you know. But then when I heard he caught something like, was it 700 waves? Wow. Did you know that? I didn't know he caught yeah. 700 waves. It's like, no, like, don't cry me, but it's bet- like someone will know, but it's definitely between five and 700 waves what recorded. A yeah. He's so nice. he didn't just, he didn't just sit there. Like I thought, oh, he's just going to sit out there and maybe catch a wave every now and then. Apparently, he caught on average, they worked it out. There's like 10 to 15 waves an hour. No He's amazing. Shit. What a legend. He galvanized an entire community. Uh, you know, he, he comes from a, a place of immense pain and grief in, in that I, I believe his father t- took his own life. And um, so, yeah, he's doing all the right things and, and that money will find a good end because he is just, you know, your typical self-made blue-collar fucking surf coach, surf instructor guy. And um, he'll put, he'll put that money to good ends. He, he's he's onto it. So yeah, I'm happy when resources make it into the right hands. Um, so it's yes. exciting. 
Yes, sir. All right, man. We'll leave it the there. Dance, man. Mr. Jed Smith, everybody. Thank you so much for your time, bro.